So we had this kind of series of lectures and seminars during the festival week, and we are organizing them from the Finnish Folk Music Institute, from this building, with the cooperation with the Folk Music Festival. And uh, it's wonderful to be, uh, have you today, Hilma, and have you, Salve, here as well, and Ritu online there later. And uh, I have to also uh, advertise you the Saturday seminar that we have also in English. Um, I have to check the name here. <laughs> non formal music education and intangible cultural heritage. So it's a two hour seminar, a three hour seminar on Saturday. And we are looking music pedagogy from Mauritius, Finland, and Denmark there as well, and having a panel discussion and lecture. So you're welcome, Romy, very much welcome there as well. Yes, thank you. You can start. Yeah, maybe I can just say hi and welcome on my behalf. <coughs> Great to see you and all of you here. Uh, because this is so momento, we will start with music. Tallavi. Please. <laughs> so this is a little polka tune we have been working with uh, master fiddler Aimo Mespakka from Vimpeli and uh, we learned one polka tune from him recently. You will see a little more videos after that. We are playing now because we have to go to, to another gig. But <laughs> tonight you can meet Tallari and Aimo at Pelimannitalo quarter to seven. So please come there and see Aimo live and also Tallari, so good to see you and uh, Aimo didn't have any name for this folk, so maybe it's Aimo's folk. <laughs> tonight it's going to be wonderful for sure. Uh, so my name is Vilma Timonen, uh, I'm a lecturer in folk music uh, at the Sibelius Academy folk music department and oh but now can we see Risu? No we can't see him there. How oh, did we see him there? Yeah, Oh, uh, Risu can have you say something? Hello. But no, we can't see him. Uh, hey, also, because you know the presenter, we'll yeah. just a second. Yeah. We'll try one more thing. Sorry, we can't see you. 
try another way. Mm. Now you're there. If you sit, then your sun lights up. Sorry, we're going to change the system one more time. Make this as big as possible. Okay, I think we'll manage with this view, right? Yes. So meet my colleague Risu Tuladar, uh, who is joining us from Kathmandu. <laughs> International, oh, but now you can't see me, let me stay here. <laughs> uh, the International Society of Music Education, ISME, South Asia Conference, Regional Conference in Kathmandu, brought together stakeholders from three different organizations Finnish Folk Music Institute, uh, Sibelius Academy, and Echoes in the Valley uh, from Kathmandu, Nepal. We soon realized that all institutes share similar interests towards preservation, safeguarding and enhancement of traditional music in our own environments, with a particular focus on educational and artistic practices. Through intensive discussions, we re recognized a need for establishing a platform for further learning together. According to our view, such platform could benefit not just our local surroundings, but provide valuable knowledge to inform the educational and artistic approaches to intangible cultural heritage globally. The pandemic slowed down our plans, but in the spring of 2021, we managed to pull together a project plan that was then supported by the Nordisk Kultur Fonden. Our collaborative project Heritage on Stage, targeted to initiate a Finnish-Nepali partnership that contributes developing local and global understandings on safeguarding and enhancing the intangible cultural heritage through artistic, educational and scholarly approaches. By developing a platform for collaborative learning and sharing, the project aimed also enhance the participants' understanding of our local practices within a global perspective. In other words, the project aimed to provide a global kaleidoscope view to the revitalizing efforts concerning the musical intangible heritage by mirroring the similar phenomena and approaches to the matter in Finland and Nepal. The folk music department at the Sibelius Academy, University of the Arts Helsinki, has almost 40 years of history in educating professional musicians and enjoys prestige and highly valued international reputation and being one of the leading units in folk music education globally. The Finnish Folk Music Institute, the activities under it contain a wide scope. Their main activities include research, field recording, archiving, publishing, education and museum work, as well as influencing through cultural politics. The Finnish Folk Music Institute is an accredited expert organization of the UNESCO Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage. The physical premises are situated here in the Folk Arts Center in Kaustinen. Kaustinen, whose fiddle playing tradition was chosen to the UNESCO's list of intangible cultural heritages in December 2021. Like the Finnish Folk Music Institute, Echoes in the Valley organization in Nepal acts as an umbrella for preservation and safeguarding of the rich cultural heritage in Nepal that consists of more than 120 ethnic groups that have their own distinct languages, costumes, food, music, and other cultural expressions. And now I'd like you to 
invite Prisu to uh, tell us a little bit more of the Echoes in the Valley. Namaste. Um, Echoes in the Valley is, we started it, it is still a community based free annual music festival. It strives to uncover, revive, and make relevant the past intangible heritages and disappearing sounds by showcasing local music, art, and performances of everyday rituals. It transforms small neighborhoods into grand stages for musical conversations between international and local artists. In addition, the festival also offers an array of interactive educational initiative and creative workshops like children music workshops, painting workshops, intergenerational education, passed down workshops on intangible heritages, calligraphy, children book reading, and things and like, you know, it goes on. So it also like uh, sorts as a guided tour uh, heritage walks. So during all of these things, we we came up with an idea, okay, a festival, a one-day festival, or, or an annual one-day festival is not enough for what we are actually trying to do as an uh, uh, educator as well as a musician and uh, as a social uh, person from this like, community. Well, how can we develop more? So we came up with an idea that we have to become an umbrella, not only a one-day festival. So with that, we came up, we became, we slowly started one by one. So the first one was music conference. The music conference, it actually, it is, Echoes in the Valley first is committed to create an engaging platform for the engagement of practices, experiences, research, and philosophies. It was in 2017 when we organized musical conference between civilist academy, Mama Academy students and professors and local musicians of Manuel village in Kathmandu, which visited, stayed at the local homes and learned the ethnic music village as they gave local musicians the opportunity to learn music. And the book was published about it uh, through, that was uh, called Perspectives from an Inter International Music Exchange in Nepal by David, David Johnson. That was published in collaboration and it includes the participants' very personal experiences. Through this, we realized that it is very needed to start this um, conversation about, about the music, uh, not only as a uh, performing art, but like what, how, how it is being taken care of in terms of education and ethics. So we started it as an annual music conference, a component that we added since 2019, where we discussed various important aspects of music. The first topic, first year's topic was music education, accessibility, and the future of Nepali music. In 2020, as you all know, we couldn't do it because of the pandemic. But in 2021, in the virtual edition, we, the, um, the conference was about the, um, you know, the copyright issues, all these uh, uh, um, intellectual property rights for all the musicians and artists from, the, from, from Nepal. Because in the age of this digital age, we are still lacking, the country is still lacking about what the, the musicians, the artists, nothing is clear about what is, the, what is the law of copyright law of Nepal, how does it work for an artist? Even me, until two years back, haven't been registered as an artist, so like, there's like a lot of things, like how do the students know no, none of these, like really, even the famous artists of Nepal doesn't, are not registered, so how are they getting royalties? So all these things, and then, we still, the government is still in the time, is still yet to come up with a digital law for, for, the, uh, for the royalties and all these uh, rights for artists, which is still not there. So we did a small um, conference about that in 2021. So after the uh, conference, we decided that we need more to just conference. So it's from the outcome of the conference uh, meeting in 2019, that we realized that we need a, an archive. So we came up with an, uh, with an archive idea. So the archive is basically all the, all the music archives that's around uh, uh, in Nepal. It basically kind of works as a private archive. So it's not easily accessible to the fellow uh, students or the new researchers or even the teachers or artists. 
So it, we feel like it's all been private properties of different entities or different institutions or even universities. Whereas we believe that these are the public property and people should have a right to get an um, uh, access to it. That's why we started this archive. It's called the Foundation Archive. We started this from September of 2021 uh, with the C grant from Goethe Institute Germany that, well, we just kind of like finished with that grant. Now we are looking for more to get these people uh, involved. We are um, seven people involved in the archive, all young ethnomusicologists as well as enthusiasts. And we are very, very thankful for uh, helping us out in this from um, Finnish Folk Music Institute was very helpful in that also. Thank you very much. And after the archive, we can like, uh, there's like more that we have to, we have to come up with. Do you know what you say the slide? Scholarships? Yeah. Uh, we also started this uh, Echo Music Scholarship Fund since 2021. We started with uh, giving scholarship to two different uh, institutions. Uh, one was for Kathmandu, Kathmandu University Department of Music, and another was Kathmandu Jazz Conservatory. So we just uh, we do not choose the candidates. We just provide a certain fund, and the institutes they would um, choose their own candidate to be uh, who would win the scholarship according to their need and their 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 skill. We are looking forward to getting this on every year with the help from various friends and we've been quite lucky so far, but yeah, it's always good to look forward and see the opportunities where we can find someone who can help these uh, young uh, musicians who are looking forward to do it, do it in the life. Check out Echoes in the Valley. Definitely, there's a lot of interesting things happening, and it's the it's really wonderful work that uh, they are doing. Coming back to the collaboration between the two in, uh, three institutions, so our collaboration uh, has included meetings, sharing, and learning together. Uh, one central activity has also been a research conducted by Risu and myself which I will now present a bit more closely. A 
our study was designed according to the following assumption. The processes where contemporary folk, professional folk musicians in Finland and Nepal create contemporary artistic performances based on traditional music could offer valuable lessons for creating educational spaces for current and historical oral music traditions in contemporary and future formal education. More precisely, articulating how the folk musicians navigate through musical and cultural meanings, form their aesthetic and ethical choices in the process, we believed could inform sustainable and ethical, yet creative formal decolonizing music education practices and research, both locally and globally. Coming back to Dalai, the research was done among musicians working in relation with the three institutions. In Finland, the research uh, interviews uh, included musicians from Dalai, an ensemble working under Finnish Folk Music Institute, and a doctoral student of the Sibelius Academy Folk Music Department. Dallar is a state-funded professional folk music ensemble whose musical expression is rooted in the rich and lively fiddle-playing tradition of Kaustinen. Through their collaboration with local amateur musicians and tradition bearers, as well as their artistic and educational activities targeted at children and the young, Dallari plays a significant role in revitalizing the musical heritage of the uh, Ostrobothnia region in particular. From Echoes in the Valley, the participants were mainly musicians in connection with the Kaleidoscope program that Risa presented earlier. Kaleidoscope supports young artists developing their musical expression and artistic identity uh, through providing them a chance of spending some time in the communities in artistic residencies. The study was guided by two research questions. One, how do professional folk musicians navigate the aesthetic, ethical and cultural meanings involved in how they use traditional music's as sources for their contemporary artistic practices? And how could these processes inform locating the traditional musics in decolonial and culturally sustainable formal music education practices that support revitalization and sustainment of intangible musical heritages in and through music education? Through shedding light to the work of folk musicians in Finland and Nepal was seen as interesting perspective that would have potential to inform music education locally and globally in matters concerning processes where forms of memory-based music making are relocated into the contemporary educational environments in an educational and future-oriented manner. The data was collected through semi-structured interviews and the participants' written reflections. In the interviews and reflective writings, the musicians from Finland and Nepal articulate the processes of how they choose the traditional musical material for their so from their sources, what kinds of choices they make along the process and why, and what kinds of deliberations guide the outcomes of their creative processes. The discussions and written reflections were then analyzed through data-driven data content analysis extremely difficult form of analysis, data-driven. <laughs> but uh, you heard some music already, but let's give voice to, the, to our informants uh, via small videos yet. So as Stallari uh, explained uh, earlier already, they have, they played music that they learned in a process where they met Aimo Maspakka, uh, Pelimanni from uh, Vimpeli, I, I guess Vimpeli was, is it correct? I think so. And uh, so they were using kind of this process with Aimo as a reference uh, in our interview, uh, semi-structured in interviews. And here is a little clip uh, just uh, to give you an idea what what does what happens in that kind of situation where the musicians meet the tradition bearer, and indeed, it's not just playing but uh, asking a lot of questions. 
discussing, talking, and stages in the process of learning folk. Uh, in Nepal, uh, Risu, maybe you could say a couple of words about what we are going to see, because now we're going to watch a little video of Pushpa uh, staying in the community and learning there. Maybe we will watch the video first and then <coughs> we can say a couple of words. <laughs> Century. 
So since um, like with glo uh, globalization, the gender uh, inequality, um, and this, uh, we have 2,400 people migrating every day for job out of country, so that we are losing a lot of people. And those, all these things are, you know, uh, kind of like supporting in, in dismantling all the traditional music and everything. So, so with that pair, uh, Puspa started like, okay, how can we help this? And we have very less people learning this kind of music, and we thought, okay, that might be a very good one too. Because this is the only one, we have more than 120 different ethnic groups like Dima has already uh, mentioned before. So this kind of music has, uh, were actually usually taught only within the same community, within the same caste, within the same, you know, this bubble. So it's, and also not to the women. And this is the, one of the first times that has broken through this problem. And see, even uh, out of it, the, 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 the community uh, uh, lifestyle. <coughs> To, to break it, to, to learn, to, to make the music alive, to get the, the wheel rolling. So this is basically, uh, this music is based on the sort of ragas, which is not created by, by any Indian raga or anywhere. It is some ragas that is still yet to be defined by so-called academics in the world. So we need a lot of things. But interestingly, what she did was, she learned this music from the guru of the community. That, that guru is a teacher. The, the guru uh, in this video is the one who was playing single. So he was the one who was singing. And the uh, uh, pasimized and double-headed uh, drums that was accompanying him. So Puspa was running from the guru and then teaching that music to the housewife of that community. Because the community also realized that it is the housewives and the mothers and the daughters. You know, all these women are the ones who are actually staying here not going to Saudi Arabia or Dubai or in sorts of jobs. So they are the ones who would be the real holders of this community music. So they decided to teach to the uh, females. That is like really, really awesome for um, uh, what we uh, think is really nice because this is, has not never been happened uh, in, in this like, community level. So that was, and but one interesting thing what Puspa said was like, um, she learned music but then she realized that since she is a musician, she is an uh, academic and a, 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 a professional music learner that's gone through like classical music uh, classes and all, she thought that she was actually unknowingly changing the notes into these notes that already existed. But something was missing, what was what she was saying, and that was very, very interesting for us. Yes. Can you put it Thank you. Uh, and this is, uh, you will hear uh, Tallaris kind of the contemporary performance, uh, what came out from the process with Aimo tonight in Pelimanditalo. But as we unfortunately don't have a Nepal musicians here, uh, we're gonna show you a little video, or music video. So this is kind of the outcome of Pushpa's project. Uh, she learned in the community, and this is her artistic. Uh, interpretation of that music.
actually um, in the frame of our little project we will publish uh, a compilation of uh, videos that uh, illustrate the both context the processes so we'll keep you updated and you'll find the videos later later on YouTube I guess um, so this was uh, this was our field uh, the context of our study. So next I'm going to lead you into what we, what we learned. Um, the musicians from Finland and Nepal were rather single-minded about how learning a particular style with a tradition bearer, community or archival recordings begins. The first step is to try to grasp the style at hand as in as much detail as possible through playing or singing. As the fiddlers in Finland focused on catching the bow movements that produced the rich and multifaceted grooves and so sound qualities, a drummer from Nepal describes his learning in a following manner. I look for the brilliant sound quality, either the sounds of drums or the overall ensemble and intensity of the player. By intensity, I mean the seriousness towards the music he's playing and how he articulates the music. The musicians highlighted that the route to learning is discovered somewhat intuitively. They highlighted that the stylistic characteristics are a complex mix of complex features to the point that it is rather challenging or next to impossible to try to verbalize what actually constitutes the style. Tallari members discussed how the style of an individual pelimanni or the style of a particular region, such as Kaustin and village, is constituted of nuances, sound quality, rough, soft, ornamentation, rhythmic phrasing, intonation and microtonalities. However, they noted that none of these features could easily be described in ways originating from the musical analysis used in Western classical music. The musicians in both countries emphasize that the musical material should be seen as inseparable from its wider socio-cultural surroundings. Indeed, all interviewed musicians emphasize that learning a tradition not, was just not about some chasing some good new tunes, as musicians from Finland articulated it. Instead, an effort should be made to achieve a deeper understanding of the context of the music and try to understand what music making means for the practitioners and for the community. In Finland, the bearers of living tradition are few, but often learning traditional musics from a particular area or getting to know individual musician styles often requires a visit to the archives of searching for material from transcriptions and printed sheet music. Nepal also has archival recordings, but as Risu described earlier, they are often privately owned by universities or other organizations, meaning that musicians or scholars outside and sometimes even inside these organizations have limited access to them. Furthermore, many of the field recordings done among the communities in Nepal have been recorded by foreign scholars who have archived their materials outside Nepal. As a result, contemporary folk musicians more commonly find the material directly in the communities, as Pushpa did, which enables, of course, a deep engagement with the societal issues around the music, also the difficult ones. As many communities in Nepal have been suppressed by the caste system and societal orders deriving from it, understanding the societal hierarchies, historical and current disparities cannot be separated from understanding these musical cultures. The musicians described various ways of developing into the contextual understandings. For example, the musicians from Finland described how small stories in the archival recordings often served as sources for contextual understandings, like the interview with uh, Aimo we heard. One Nepali interview also highlighted the potential of song lyrics as means for developing contextual understanding. However, some musicians stress the importance of contextual understanding behind the archival recordings themselves. For example, musician 5 and 1 from Finland noted 
that without understanding the context of these recordings, the often classically trained contemporary musicians and musicians that are used to studio quality recordings might fail to find the value in these archive recordings. Secondly, musician one from Finland pointed out that the musician's premise for making music differs for, from that of today, today's professional musicians who aim for public performances or predefined qualities and do not play for mere enjoyment or for sociocultural purposes. All the interviewed musicians articulated that ethical contemplation was a salient part of the process. On the one hand, they felt obligated towards the tradition bearers as they wanted to show respect to their musical skills and the tradition they carried. The members of Tallari, for instance, described how on the rare occasion when they had been able to play with a tradition bearer, they had rather intuitively chosen not to arrange the material too much. Instead, they would support the tradition bearer in their music making and join in in ways that would help the tradition bearer to reach his or her full potential in the situation. An informant from Nepal described how she tries to increase the tradition bearer's appreciations towards their practice by asking very detailed questions about the music. Musicians from both countries described how showing appreciation to the tradition bearer's musicians' skills was one ultimate goal of these sessions. In this study, the Finnish musicians who had received Western classical training seemed to connect aesthetic navigation with a critical examination of this influence. They admitted that it was hard to overcome some of the qualities adopted from the cl classical training, such as ergonomics and particular ideals in intonation and pitch, even when they would go against the traditional playing style. Also, the complexities of transcriptions arose a vivid and passionate discussion. Similarly, the musicians in both countries struggled to express, for instance, the rhythmical group in a in particular playing style that does not fall under the metrics of Western music. As discovered, the ex expressions available, such as unstable tempo or uneven metrics, refer to the stability in the tempo as a norm and anything that does not fall under this norm is somehow imperfect. In these, their contemporary performances, the musicians often chose to connect with Western popular music, particularly when the targeted audience was the young. The aim was single-mindedly stated as means to get the young generation interested in these traditions. The musicians of Tallari explained that in their school concerts, they tend to arrange the musical material based on what they anticipate might speak the musical language of the youth. In other words, popular music. Musician four from Nepal explained that experimenting with new playing techniques that derive inspiration from popular music and bringing traditional instruments such as sarangi into popular music environments could help prove that Sarangi can be played in any genre to connect to people or to inspire or motivate the newer generation towards the instruments. So, what to make of all this for music education? Without exception, the folk musicians interviewed provided very detailed information about whose music they were learning, to which area, to which era it belonged and to which community it was rooted. When it comes to diversity in music education, there is a need to recognize local and global diversities, recognizing also that in seemingly monocultural areas, the territories consist abundance of indigenous and other kinds of cultural pluralities. Thus, peeking behind the veil of national would seem as a necessary step. Indeed, as pointed out by Biddle and Knights, the national, in its all varied imaginations, can sometimes seem too cumbersome, too amorphous, wrongly scaled, or even hostile to these 
local human practices. Thus, shifting our gaze from national to territorial could support this critically oriented interrogation. Moreover, understanding the local music traditions as intangible cultural heritages rooted in the communities, groups and individuals concerned could allow educators and scholars to better conceptualize the nature of such traditions. Importantly, this conceptualization could bring us closer to the possibilities of seeing music education in terms of human rights, social justice that emphasizes the right for diverse cultural expressions. When claiming space for these diverse local cultural expressions, the music education stakeholders should be able to critically acknowledge the valuations and hegemonies that silence the diverse soundscapes, both locally and globally, and constructing music education practices that appreciate diverse musical expressions in their own right and not in relation to some other musical tradition such as the Western classical or popular music. Revisiting the vocabulary that diminishes the essential features of these musics could serve as a starting point for decolonizing music education. All the musicians interviewed considered themselves as tradition bearers. Thus, the aesthetic choices they made along the process were deeply connected to their self-determined ethical obligation to revitalize the traditions and keep them alive for the future generations. As the interviewed musicians identified themselves as links in the centuries-long chain of tradition bearers, they highlighted their desire for connecting with the musical traditions but took also the opportunity and liberty to shape them. Indeed, this resembles Christopher Small's definition of musicking. Creative exploration of diverse music traditions, relocating a variety of stylistic features into contemporary musical settings, requires rather comprehensive abilities to distinguish and play diverse expressions. Moreover, the creative exploration calls for thorough ethical commitment that connect the handling of the musical material to complex questions about culturally related ethical responsibilities. According to the findings of this study, education in and of musical traditions is a challenging task, as it requires historical, contextual and cultural understanding, musical abilities to produce diverse expressions and abundance of critical mindset. Decolonizing music education calls for understanding the intertwined political, ethical and related aesthetic valuations that have influenced and still influence the formation of the local. As such, the turn towards music education practices that would accommodate musical heritages, diversity of sounds and culturally rooted expressions requires thorough investigation of the purpose that music education is serving. The question then is, are formal music education institutions ready to commit in truly intercultural education, even with the cost of having to problematize the hegemonies and prevailing socio-political realities, stretching their epistemological understandings as those could be the painful yet necessary steps that need to be taken towards decolonizing future of music education. And our full paper will be published actually next week, one week from now, Thursday, I guess, uh, in the evening at the International Society of Music Education World Conference. And here are the details of that publication, so check it out when it's out. But now, thank you, and we have some 10 minutes for discussion. It would be lovely to hear your thoughts on whatever has come to your mind. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Vilma, for this presentation. And then we wish you that you could join us virtually here today. And it would have been great to see you here, but a warm welcome to your festival and to your archive from here from Kaltinen. And uh, I 
don't know if my system really is clear, but uh, different musicians describe uh, differences if they brought the material from the archive compared to the tra tradition period. And then when the music was in the States, uh, could, could they be more crea creative, for example, if they took the music from the archive compared if they make the music together with the tradition period? Yes. Uh, yes, they did. And this is something that I, I have been thinking now a lot. Uh, there is some, uh, it's, it was quite clear that the closer you are the tradition, kind of if you are in the, in the, working in the community, and uh, the Finnish musicians describe that very, very much in detail as well. So when you are playing with a tradition bearer, then you really try to uh, be quite precise that you're doing it exactly as the source mm -hmm. so kind of that that was considered a way of showing the respect um, but then kind of more so like there's this logic of proximity the further you are from the tradition uh, then easier it was to kind of mess around with it yeah. <laughs> and they they described also we discussed that uh, with actually with all of the musicians that uh, if there was a case that they knew that they were going to perform it to people who come from that tradition then they were really conscious about not doing too much of <laughs> uh, strange stuff mm -hmm. with the music but uh, the ethical deliberation the, like uh, I think it was just this like the most important thing was to discover how much effort they actually put into this navigation without necessarily realizing it themselves. But yeah, this law of proximity and distance was the guiding feature in that. Eva. Thank you very much for the very soon and Bima for doing this project. I think it's a, a very interesting and to go into detail and, and continuing on your question. I'm just wondering if there's another level as well uh, into this, that if uh, I'm thinking about uh, traditions in West Africa and also in Sweden, uh, my own tradition, that if, uh, uh, if a tune is given to me by a traditional bearer, it's given to me with the promise from my side that I will make it mine and not imitate. So it's a part of the duty and, and as a, a learner to make it your own and be creative. And the same, but even more exaggerated in Mandinka tradition in, in Gambia, for example, that if I hear a story that Vilma Timonon tells me, then when I tell it to someone else, I will have to change the wording of it because otherwise it's not Vilma Timonen's story. Because Vilma Timonen gave it to me with uh, that attitude of bringing it, giving something for the future, not to be static. So thinking of tradition uh, in the sense of a non-static uh, uh, kind of uh, organism that is alive, uh, the, the question of creativity that you brought up uh, has this dimension as well, depending on how you see it, of course. Yes. But maybe uh, that dimension that you took up, that, that uh, we show respect for the tradition bearers by not changing, is just one of the stages towards uh, really taking care of, of that music. I don't know how, how you see it, if you see different uh, approaches uh, with your reforms towards what creativity could be uh, in, in the context of decolonization. Yes, and this is of course the question that we are faced um, as musicians and as music teachers. Uh, how do, what is our view to tradition? Do we consider it uh, static? or in constant flux. Mm. And uh, positioning ourselves in that kind of line using shippers, uh, 
Jana uh, idea. Uh, okay, where, where do I position myself within this activity? What do I choose? And uh, this is the question that, uh, that when we discussed about that, it's something that needs, this question needs revisiting every time and like in every process. So it's not like, okay, I always do this and I always do that, but that's the kind of the, um, and I guess that goes with any ethical deliberations. And what counts as ethical deliberation is that you don't have any fixed positionalities or fixed uh, rules, but it's something that needs just constant but I mean, uh, I think our time is quite uh, specific in this, uh, like compared to the past. Uh, I mean, all the traditions have been in constant flux, adapting to different influences everywhere and throughout the humankind, history of humankind. But in our time, when all the influences are basically behind one click of a computer, then that kind of these questions are more acute than ever, perhaps before. So this is why we are in a new situation uh, compared to, let's say, our grandparents who still lived this slowly changing, evolving traditions. Birk. Uh, thank you very much for this incredible work you have done together. Uh, and for me, it's a kind of missing link of uh, the debates we have in the context of uh, intangible cultural heritage and cultural diversity, uh, because uh, we have a lot of debates on decolonizing uh, the, the museums, uh, all the objects uh, to, uh, uh, um, to restitute uh, uh, all this is what we find in, in the museums as a result of uh, uh, colonial times, but um, we never have uh, made a look into the archives, and the archives is a kind of horror cabinet, if we want to say, uh, because uh, um, we know that uh, a, a big majority of recordings from the global south is in the global is in the western archives and close and with wrong uh, descriptions and uh, they are not accessible for for for, uh, for all those who are carrying on uh, the traditions in, uh, in the world so um, this is uh, the archives is one thing but the cultural political meaning of your study uh, I really um, find that this is exactly what has to be uh, discussed uh, because it goes beyond the national concepts. Mm. Uh, and this is the one of the big problems with the uh, uh, Intangible Cultural Heritage uh, Convention because it's under the roof of the national concept of UNESCO and UN. And so uh, all these traditions are classified by nations. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we go into the Cultural Diversity Convention, we have the dynamic, that what you mm -hmm. said, we have to review. But this knowledge that we have to review uh, the, uh, the contemporary creation, looking backward and forward, uh, had not been adapted to the Intentional Cultural Heritage Convention. Uh, so, in fact, uh, what has to be done is a kind of a review of this convention uh, with, uh, with, with the actual knowledge we have, uh, we have uh, gained. And what you have done for music is exactly the same mm -hmm. uh, to start this project, uh, uh, this process. And um, yeah, I can just thank you and we can now uh, decline it uh, through many, many uh, music traditions, uh, regional music traditions globally in relation to the Western world and uh, this is the work which has to be carried.
break out soon. Yeah. I, we discussed that uh, a little bit more in detail in the article actually, this how in Finland and Nepal the influence of the nationalization projects uh, have, has muted what, what it has done to these local heritages and so yeah we're talking about that uh, a lot and this was something that was kind of uh, I think one of the main contributions to my from my perspective as well uh, a very obvious thing but uh, needs to be said out loud <laughs> thank you baby I just feel it's so powerful um, coming from uh, my wife and I are music educators in Maine and, uh, in America, and uh, we, we go through this. Well, you learn about Bach and Mozart, and, this, 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 and then you automatically, as a young teacher, you're just going to spread that. And so, <laughs> so, just at least every music educator must have this type of reading, this type of lecture to say, you must be open-minded and be sensitive. You don't want to just carbon copy a bunch of misinformation and one-sided viewpoints. Uh, and, and we went from a point of that to, oh, now we'll do a unit on Africa, and yay, no, that's not good enough. It has to be, and, and I love the term decolonizing because it, it, it is so much more precise to areas and time periods and just to be aware and to be sensitive mm. to that so we don't squash certain viewpoints, cultures, etc. Yes. So, thank you. Thank you, Scott. And I think this is a, it's a quite important discussion also, like connecting this. What do we mean? What are, what are the educational aims, and what is the what is the purpose of our education? And this, I'm hoping to discuss it a little bit more in detail on Saturday uh, in the seminar. But now I think it's time to thank <laughs> thank you all. I'm really pleased that you came here, and lovely. Uh, hope to continue the discussions later on. And thank you. <laughs>